I was raised right outside of Lexington, North Carolina. It was a nice little town, but it wasn't too big. My dad was Ed Everett Lee Frank. Mother was Annie Wood Frank. I had two brothers and two sisters. I was born in 1924, September 24, and so that threw me right in the middle of the Depression. We was raised in the country, and we raised a lot of stuff that we eat. Sunday, December 7th, 1941, we was playing tag football. When we come up to the house, it was coming in on the radio that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor that morning and killed a whole bunch of our soldiers and sailors and so forth. We knew then we was in war. We didn't know how bad it was gonna be, but we had never finished school yet then. And uh, we didn't think it affected us, but it did. Before it got over with, I was in the middle of it. I got drafted in May of 43, and it was 50 of us. I got a picture of 50 of us standing on the courthouse ship in Lexington, North Carolina. So I took the Army. They shipped us to, on a troop train to Camp Shelby, Mississippi. I was with the 271st Infantry Regiment and the 69th Division at Camp Shelby, and we trained us as a division. They wanted somebody to volunteer to be a BAR man, and they held it up and said it'd shoot four or five hundred rounds a minute. I volunteered. The Browning automatic rifle is what we call the BAR. It was fully automatic weapon. Then it was the only automatic weapon in the rifle squad. I could disassemble it and put it back together in 10 minutes time blindfolded. Push this right here. I lived and sleep with the BAR. On June the 6th, we was on that ship. The invasion was supposed to come off on the 5th. And it, it was a storm so bad, General Eisenhower postponed it, but the weather got a little bit better. And we was all sick on that ship. English Channel was real rough. He decided to go on the 6th. If he didn't get it off on the 6th, it would be a month before he could do it. When we pulled up, we wasn't in the first waves. It was, actually, it was after dinner when we got off. But when we pulled up there and it dropped the gate on that LST, the first tank that went off went under and they cranked the gate back up, pulled around, them guys, I don't, they drowned it. I don't know what happened to them, but uh, we went on any closer. And then when it dropped the gate the next time, I bailed out in water about chest deep. And I had the BAR, which weighed 22 pounds, and 200 rounds of 30 out six, and some hand grenades hanging on my uniform, and all the other paraphernalia that went with soldiers that I was supposed to have. If I'd have stepped in a hole and fell down, I'd have drowned it, because I couldn't have got up. There was four divisions of infantry landed on Utah Beach, and I was assigned to the 90th, and we were more or less a backup division. And I got in combat on a night patrol, and I shot 60 rounds through the BAR into a machine gun nest. I thought I was in a pretty good position, and the sergeant said, Frank, move. And I didn't move, and he cussed and said, I said, move. Well. I hadn't known him too long, but I decided maybe I'd better move. I jumped up and run about 30 yards and hit the ground and rolled over, ready to shoot again. And where I left from, a 88 shell this time. He had been in combat in North Africa. He knows what to do. I didn't. If I hadn't have moved, I wouldn't be here today. Well, we'd dig foxholes. Every time we stopped, we'd dig a hole to get in. I was pretty good at digging. Edsworthy wasn't too good at digging. I dig, I do the digging and he'd shovel it out. It wasn't gonna be there too long. We could get the hole big enough for me and him to lay down in and say 18 or 20 inches deep and we'd stop. And then when they'd shell us with artillery or shell us with tanks, we'd dig again. A lot of times when we moved out of that hole, it would be chest deep. I don't care what nobody says. I was scared and I admitted I was scared, afraid. A lot of guys said I never was afraid. They lying, they was. When they run them tanks up amongst us, your teeth would shatter. Could keep them from chatter, just like he went in a river in cold water, stayed in there long, your teeth would go to chatter. Me and Paul was sitting on our foxhole, his tank come running up through there, jumping over them hedgerows, 
And I said, Paul, that's what we need to be in. And about that time, the whole tank just stopped, just shook two or three times. And, boy, and the turret flew off of it, the tank caught a fire, and the only guy that got out of it was on fire and they burnt to death. I said, I think I'll stay in the infantry. I also seen a mortar crew set a mortar up and the third shell they shot, they had set it over a, a landmine. And that landmine went off and just, there wasn't nothing but pieces of them guys left. Civilians wonder why we have nurse breakdowns. And when you see things like that, you don't ever forget it. July the 6th, they called out. They wanted a 10-man patrol to go out and make contact with I and L Company. They had got cut off out there. We got out there near Boubadre. We come to this highway, and we went across the highway, and I was in the front part of the patrol. B.A.R. always was. And Ellsworth was back towards the back. And uh, they cut loose on us with a machine gun. We started to cross the highway close to where they had a machine gun set up. And the sergeant who was leading us didn't know that. Me and two more guys got across the highway, and the rest of them fell back, but we didn't know that at that time. It was dark. And uh, we got back off the road because the Germans come down the road to, and then went back up. We heard him walking, but we couldn't see him. I crawled back up when it started breaking day and seen there wasn't none of our boys laying there in the road. And I know then that is where they had got back. And that morning, about 7 or 8 o'clock after it got daylight, I got shot in the left shoulder. Action knocked me down. Got to burning and, and uh, felt blood running down my back. And then I realized I shot. Of course, I couldn't handle the BAR. That was too heavy. And I shot in the shoulder and pulled the trigger housing out of it and threw it in the swamp. We had no ammunition for it. And we swam across that uh, waterway. And when we walked out on the other side, there was a German there with a submachine gun and we'd give up. They'd either give up or get killed. He kept telling us something to do, and we didn't know what, what he was saying. And uh, he'd come down with that thing and shot right across the front of our feet, knocked dirt up on us, and we'd stripped off naked. That's what he wanted us to do. He wanted to know we didn't have no weapons. They took us captive. One of the guys got shot through the leg and broke his bone in his leg above the knee. They killed him. He couldn't walk. I didn't tell him I was shot. And uh, they couldn't tell I was shot when I wasn't using this arm much. We talked this guard in the, if he'd give us something to drink, we'd give him some American cigarettes. Sign language, mostly. He couldn't talk English, we couldn't speak German. But he brought us a half a gallon bucket full of apple cider. And we gave him three or four or five cigarettes. And, and then the next, next morning, uh, his, his German captain interrogated me and uh, asked me my name. I gave him a name, rank, and serial number. That's what we were supposed to do. And uh, he said, uh, Frank, said, you fighting against your own ancestors? I said, no, sir, Captain. My ancestors in Tyro, North Carolina. He said, where in the H is Tyro at? I said, it's about halfway between Reeds and Churchland on Highway 150. From there, they would walk us back or ride us back on a train sometimes. And we got Shalom, France. And by that time, I had got uh, corruption that set up in my bullet wound. Bullet was still in me. They picked up one of our first aid men and they let him keep his bag. and. He seen I needed some help, and he went to doctor on me, and believe it or not, in a couple of weeks, he had that thing healed up, corruption gone, and that man saved my life. Ain't no doubt about it. Well, I was at Shalom, France, that put us in the box car every day, right before dinner, and our P-38s was Trafus, Trafus rail yard sometime that evening. And one time they killed, I think it was 16 or 18 men in the box car out of the end. And when you look up and see them 50 caliber bullets tearing the box, top of the box car out, you'll say a prior then. Can't help it. You need all the help you can get. 
but I survived it somehow or another. And I think my mama's prayers saved me. Put us on a train car and took us to Camp Dialogue 4B. It wasn't a good train ride. 50 of us in a boxcar, about the half size of the boxcars we got over here. You didn't get out, get no water in the summertime. We had a five gallon bucket for 50 men to use for a bathroom on that train car. And when we stopped in a railroad station, they would take the five gallon bucket and dump it out and wrench it out a little bit, fill it up with drinking water, and we drank that water. Why it didn't kill us, I don't know. They took us to Camp Dialogue 4B, and it was more or less an army base, built like an army base, one-story barracks, and the water in the 4B wasn't fit to drink, food wasn't hardly fit to eat, but you eat it, and the lice would eat you up at night. We got to the Klaus Airfield near Dresden, and we was actually 16 kilometers from Dresden. This airfield had never been bombed, and Dresden had never been bombed. At this German airfield, which was a work camp, we stayed in one of the barracks. It was fenced in with barbed wire. We got better food there, a little, bit, a little more of it, but uh, we needed to get better food. Uh, it basically consisted of turnips and potatoes, and once a month we got a horse head, and there was 107 107 of us prisoners there. We worked 12 hours a day, shifts, rain or shine, and we unloaded pump wood that come in to make the paper out of. I seen these big uh, hair, German, uh, European hairs, they call them, and give me an idea to make a slingshot. I was raised in the country and we hunted rabbits and squirrels and uh, there was a lot of quail back in. Well, we didn't have, uh, money to buy guns to hunt with, so we uh, hunted with slingshots. A country boy knows how to do what it takes to survive. Here, here's the slingshot. And I had a Russian pocket knife, and I don't remember exactly how I got a hold of it, but I had slipped it in the lining of my field jacket, and I cut the rubbers with it, and I made the pad to hold the ammunition out of part of my shoot tongue. I killed several rabbits with this thing, big rabbits. One of them, or me, one would boot leg them in, and my breeches leg of were eating, and the guards never didn't know we had the rabbit in there. And uh, we'd dress him down in the basement that night and throw the hide and the entrails in the fire and burn them up, and we'd boil the rabbit in water, and then we'd eat the rabbit meat and drink the juice. We didn't waste none of it. We got all the food we could. I realized Early on, after I got captured, I was gonna have to learn German to get the hell knocked out of me every time they told me something. And so I started paying more attention to what they said because they would tell us something to do and we didn't know what they were saying and they couldn't talk English, the ordinary German couldn't. They didn't explain it to us, they just knock us down with a rifle barrel or the butt of the rifle and to keep that from happening, I'd try to figure out what the man was saying. And then uh, it didn't take too long. It might have been because I was a, my ancestors were German. I picked it up pretty good. It sprayed in the Dutch to feel. And in the meantime, they knew I had a bad shoulder. And they sent me over to this hospital on a train with a, with a guard with me, cut the bullet out of me. He threw the bullet in, the, in a pan there. And I said, Captain, what are you gonna do with that bullet? He said, I'll give it to you, and he picked it up and handed it to me. That's it right there. I wear it to this day, almost every day, on my dog tag chain, till I got ashamed and went and bought me a gold chain to wear it on. It's, it's part of my life. We didn't know what was going on exactly. Battle of Bulls started the 16th of December, and they overrun the 106th Division in a matter of 24 hours. The Germans called it the Battle of the Ardennes. We went to bed on the night of the 12th, February 45, and we got woke up around two o'clock, 
and, and the air raid siren was going off. We were supposed to go to the air raid shelter for which we were built in the ground that we had to get in when the air raid shells went off. The planes come over and they dropped the flare out. And we said, oh God, they're gonna, they're gonna bomb the airfield. And they turned and went in on Dresden. In just a few minutes, we hear them bombing Dresden. Well, we, we didn't let the Germans see us do it, but we clapped. We were happy when we seen them bombing Dresden. Daylight, the B-17 started coming in. They bombed Dresden continuously. I've seen two of the B-17s got knocked down about dinner time that day. I don't know what a uh, shell hit them or what, but they blowed in two. None of the crew got out. They had 10 men on each plane. We could hear the bombs going off in the daytime, and that night we could see the light of the city burning. The city of Dresden burning up. The 17th, we were working on the public yard mill. There hadn't been no air raid siren went off or nothing. Hell broke loose over there on that airfield. And we seen four P-47 American fighter planes come in. They worked the field over pretty good, but they lost the plane. Seen one go down, trailing smoke. We didn't see him hit the ground. I don't know what happened to him, but uh, the other three left. Well, later on that evening, there was a big bunch of them come in, like a bee swarm. And when they left, there wasn't a plane on the field, there wasn't a building, it wasn't on fire, except the one that had POW on top of it. I think them pilots were low enough they could see where we had painted POW on it. They moved us out about seven o'clock that night. We hit the road, the road was full of German civilians. We walked all night Saturday night, all day Sunday. Sunday night, make it short, we walked to Tuesday morning without stopping to get anything to eat. <laughs> no, no sleep. They let us break on Tuesday morning. I actually seen some of the Germans pull their horses and the harness to the drop dead. They had too much weight on the wagons and they were doing everything to get away from the Russian they could just like us. Sometime during April on that marching we done, we got down there in that village and they had a roadblock set up and had a guard on it and we had a place to go around one end of it and he stopped us. And I told him in German, I said, we're going out there to work on a paper uh, a farm and we got to get out there. Don't that farmer's going to turn us in and we're going to be in trouble. And I convinced that German that we need to go out there to work. And about the time he turned us loose and we went uh, 20 or 30 yards, a German lieutenant come out of a building there and he stopped us. And uh, I told him the same thing. And he said, no, there ain't no work out there to be done. There ain't gonna be nothing going on out there but fighting. Well, he took us back in there and set us down. He was over there working on a desk and uh, we didn't know he could talk English. I talked to him in German. And uh, directly he raised up, and we talked. We called him bad names. I don't mind admitting it. And uh, what we'd like to do to him and all, and he raised up and talked better English than I could. And he said, I know y'all escaped prisoners. You might as well admit to it. Where'd you come from? I told him. He sent us back right where we come from. May the 7th, we was about wore out, wore down to a nerve. And that ain't about three o'clock, they stopped us out there and said, just sit down. And we sat there an hour more, and some of the young guards went in the building, come out, changing clothes, they didn't have their uniform on. And we talked amongst ourselves, something's happening, we didn't know who was. And we could hear the Russian artillery getting closer all the time. And the old German sergeant, he come out, and he still had his uniform on. He said, Germans surrendered today, at the 7th of May of 45. And uh, he said, y'all free to go. Well, we didn't know whether to go or not. We sat there and directly come back and said, go. He wanted us to leave. And we got up and left. Went on down the road and just before dark got in, we ran into a little village about like Advance. And uh, about dark we, run in, uh, we met a sergeant on a jeep. 
He just told us to just sit down. You've walked far enough. Now you got a truck up there and haul us into a little village there, a town. We got to Camp Lucky Strike. Sometime, a day or two after we got there, they weighed us, I weighed 117 pounds. And when I went left England, I weighed 212 pounds. So uh, I lost about 90 plus pounds. General Eisenhower come out there and come to the, we were lucky enough to come to the tent we was in and he talked to us and he said, uh, we're gonna do everything we can for y'all. And he, he got a telephone and let us call home. Yeah, I called my sister Naomi, told her, I'm back in the hands of the United States Army. I'm alive and healthy and let daddy and mama know that I'm alive. And he also went to chow with us. They had a little guy putting out the butterscotch pudding. And I hadn't had nothing like that for 10 months. And I love butterscotch pudding. And he just put one spoonful in my mess kit. And I said, give me some more of that pudding. He said, you got all the pudding, I'm, I ain't going to give you no more. I'm in charge of putting out the pudding. I now stepped out of the line, stepped up there, and he said, give that man all the pudding he wants. And that guy looked up at him and, and said, I'm dipping out this uh He said, yes, sir, boss, yes, sir. I'll give him all he wants. And I, I think, thank God for them five stars. <laughs> I caught a railway bus in the Lexington, North Carolina from Fort Bragg. I beat on the door and woke Mama up. She comes to the door and it was hallelujah for Ben Owens. I am one of the luckiest men in the world to be here. And I know it. We won World War II. It lasted three years and eight months. Most of us boys in service was 18 to 25 years old, and there was 16 million of us in service. A half a million got killed, and there's still 82,000 missing in action. I asked Carl, the, the supervisor that was over me in the paper mill, I said, how in the world did y'all let Hitler, y'all good people, the Germans is. I said, how did y'all let him get control of y'all? He said, well, they come around and told us they wanted to just, they didn't want to take up our weapons. Said I, I had a rifle, a shotgun. They just wanted to know where all the weapons was at. And uh, we had to arrest them, number on them. And uh, said about six months later, I was there working and said a German half track pulled up in the yard with a squad of SS troops on it. Said they got out with a, with a pad said, you got rifle so-and-so and shotgun so-and-so? said, no, I got rid of him. He said, well, you got 10 minutes to come up with him. Don't, we're gonna kill your wife and youngins. So that's the way he got control of us. I found it out the hard way. I laid my gun down because I run out of ammunition. And they kicked my tail, and stuck me with a bayonet. Whatever they wanted to do to me, there wasn't no way I could stop them. Y'all didn't ask, ask nobody to come here today, and I didn't ask, ask nobody to come here today. That's freedom. I didn't realize what freedom was till I got shot and got captured. And when I got liberated, I know what freedom was. I always tell everybody I talk to that. Our young folks need to know what we got, and they ain't getting it because it ain't teaching them more. We got stuff that no other country ain't got. We ain't perfect by a whole lot, but we're still the best country in the world. Last November 11th, they had me down to Charlotte. The French government awarded the French Legion of Honor on me. They give it to 15 of us. Most of them was Air Force men, and most of them couldn't stand up. A lot of them was in wheelchairs. I'm, I'm a lucky dude. I told the guy next to me, I said, I'm not gonna sit down and get my medal. I stood up and he pinned it on me. And I said, Merci, Monsieur. And that tickled that ambassador of sight. And he wrote me a letter after that, said, you don't want to thank me. And he sent me a 
a certificate and congratulated me and said it was an honor to pin it on me.